for more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. From the 18th to the 24th of October, Congolese as well as Africans both in the continent and across the world are marking Breaking the Silence Congo Week. Now this is a week, this is a week of celebration, this is a week of commemoration, a week of events which are dedicated to covering both the crisis in the Congo that has been going on currently over the past many decades, as well as a spirit of resistance that is so important to the kind of movements that are happening there. And this is, like I said, not just an event or a series of events or a movement in one country, but for the entire continent. And today to talk more about this, we have with us Kambale Musauli, who's an analyst with the Center for Research on the Congo. Thank you so much, Kambale, for joining us. Thank you. Kamali, could you first start with maybe talking about what is the, say, uh, defining spirit behind the Congo Week? Because like uh, you mentioned itself, it started in 2008, it's been 12 years, it's marked across the world. So usually, what is the main message that uh, activists like you, scholars, researchers, students, or together as a kind of present during this week? The spirit beyond Congo Week is to make sure that the world know that in this time, we have about over 6 million people of Congolese who have died. But more importantly, the, um, how can I say, the potential of the DRC is something that's hidden. So we always talk, call it like breaking the silence, Africa best, uh, Africa's uh, best kept secret. The reason why we say that is one, people do not know. Uh, the tragedy of the Congo, and people do not know the potential. Uh, those, those are the two extremes uh, for the Congo. Started in uh, 2008 uh, by students saying, we will share with our communities what to do. And today, after 12 years, I'm still amazed at how many people around the world continue uh, to observe this week. And our goal is the liberation for DRC. You know, the people of the Congo have been in the struggle to control their own affairs since 1885. And the struggle is ongoing up until today uh, for the total liberation of the Congolese people uh, to transform the entire African continent. So, Kabali, you talked about 1885. And uh, there is there's a story, a history of Belgian colonialism. And even before direct Belgian colonialism, there is a history of the brutal uh, root, direct single person rule by Leopold himself. And... Of course, after that, we've, uh, there's, a, there's a history of exploitation, especially for the mineral and natural wealth of the Congo, which uh, was where in which almost all major Western players have been involved as well. And uh, on, the, on the other hand, there is also the recognition by the resistance from the very early uh, history itself, how important the Congo is to not only to African liberation and global liberation for that matter. So could you maybe take us through both these strands, one of the kind of uh, planned exploitation that has been happening and also maybe talk a bit about the kind of larger perception of resistance as well that has been very key to the Congo. The Africa we know today was shaped by the so-called Berlin Conference uh, that took place from 1884 to 85. So Western nations sat down in Berlin uh, to decide not just the covering up of the African continent, but who will take control of a land the size of Western Europe? They didn't give it to a country. They gave it to one man, King Leopold II. And he ran it as his personal property uh, from uh, 1885 to 1908. And during his rule, we had uh, extraction of resources, particularly ivory and also rubber. Uh, rubber was essential uh, for the technology of the time, the tires of the cars, the tires of the uh, bicycles. There was a boom in the automobile industry at the time and you know, the bicycles at the time. But during that exploitation, uh, Congolese people died, right? They were subjected to inhumane conditions, right. uh, mutilated, killed. Uh, it is estimated that about 10 to 15 million Congolese died during that period. And there hasn't been accountability even for that you know, I mean, it's a crime that can be compared to what happened during World War I and even World War II with the Holocaust. But most people do not even know that 10, 50, 10 to 15 million Congolese people died. But whenever uh, the brutal regime of Leopold ended, mainly due to a global mobilization 
or people like George Washington Williams, a Civil War veteran who actually went to the Congo, uh, saw what was happening and advocated for the liberation of the Congo. And he called what was happening in the Congo crimes against humanity. He's actually the one who coined that term. Right. And that term was coined uh, in the case of the Congo. But there were others who mobilized during that time uh, to bring an end to it. So after the global mobilization uh, to stop King Leopold's rule, Congo was given to the Belgians, not to the Congolese. Belgians continued to rule the Congo from around 1908 up to 1960. But during that period, there were many resistance uh, taking place. You had Simon Kimbangu uh, called him a community organizer who was mobilizing, spreading even Pan-African message. He had Marcus Garvey newspaper during the time in the early 1910s, distributing it and calling on Congolese to take control of their land and resources. During that period, Unfortunately, the Belgians saw him as a threat to the regime and they put him in jail uh, for 27 years. He actually died in jail and many others uh, continued. But this period is very important for the African continent. While Congolese are struggling against Belgian uh, colonialism, seeing how their resources are being exploited, the uranium are being taken out of the Congo in a, in, the, during World War II and was used to uh, bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And seeing all of that exploitation during that time, they themselves decided to be engaged in a continental campaign. And that continental campaign stemmed from all the young Africans, some of whom participated in the Fifth Pan-African Congress in 1945 in Manchester, came back on the African continent um, mobilizing one of them, Kwame Nkrumah, who became the head of state of Ghana in 1957. Uh, and, and of course, you had the, the Nyerere and the others also mobilized during that time. And their call in this period was independence now. We cannot live on the African continent and try to unite when we don't control our land and our resources. And that strategy was shared with Patrice Lumumba, who attended a very important conference in 1958 in Ghana, the All-African People's Conference. When Patrice Lumumba, Gaston Diomi, and Joseph Ngalula visited Ghana during that period, met Fanon, met Padmore, met many others uh, who participated during the, this meeting, they were clear now why they needed to go back on the ground to mobilize for independence. As they returned to the Congo, they didn't return alone. Other Africans came with them. You had Chadians, you had Cameroonians, you had Central Africans, particularly André Blouin. Uh, she was uh, actually working very closely with Patrice Lumumba. Uh, she's actually the one who wrote the Independence Day speech that Patrice Lumumba read on June 30th, 1960. And her engagement uh, during the time helped lift up the voice of the Congolese women. She is known to have mobilized over 45,000 Congolese women to join the alliance of the Mouvement National Congolais and the Parti Solidaire Africain. And they are the one who won the independence, uh, um, the independence election right. in May 1960. But I'm sharing all of this to say that if it wasn't for Pan-Africanism, Congo wouldn't have become independent. It took an active effort of young Africans even coming to the Congo, working with Congolese through an ideology that was very clear. Take control of the land, take control of the resources, exploit these resources for the benefit of the people and transform the entire African continent. And this is the plan that came from Kruma. So with Patrice Lumumba mobilizing and organizing and becoming successful at his, uh, uh, the team be becoming successful uh, gaining independence in the Congo, they didn't sit well with the U.S. president. And that president at the time was uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who in, July, in August of 1960, uh, in, uh, when you read the record, I think it was either July or August of 1960, the National Security Council record shows that Dwight Eisenhower told his CIA uh, staff who participated uh, his advisors were participating in, the, in this meeting that Patrice Lumumba needed to be eliminated. He had just taken power in 
less than a month, and there was already a call to kill him. And unfortunately, on, on January 17, 1961, Patrice Lumumba was brutally murdered by the CIA, a Belgian, and Congolese sarcophant. Um, this period uh, pretty much stole the future of Africa. Because um, there is a book by Je Justin Podou that looks into the situation in the Congo. Uh, the intro of his book is fantastic. He actually made me cry. He, he writes a speech that Patrice Lumumba is making on June 30th, 2020. What would Patrice Lumumba say today? Remembering the struggle of the Congo, uh, how Congo, Congo has not developed and transformed itself. That it, it made me realize even much more something that many Congolese know that if Lumumba stayed alive and was able to continue his mission, Pan-Africanism would have had a stronger foothold on the African continent and have Congo as the heart of the engine for the whole transformation of Africa. So the death of Lumumba was really stealing the future of the African continent. And when we look at what's happening on the African continent today, uh, one can guess um, why Africa is where it is. And I always argue, you know, think about Congo's size, size of Western Europe, think about its wealth, an estimated $24 trillion, which is the US and Europe GDP combined. Uh, think about its potential of all the resources that it has from cobalt to coltan. I mean, the green uh, environmental movement today cannot exist without the Congo. Right. Um, Congo holds 40% of Africa French water reserves. Um, Congo has a young population, you know, 30 to 40 million young Congolese. We have an 81 million population where half of the population is under the age of 18. This youth can completely transform the African continent right. if they're able to garner the right forces, the organizing forces on the ground, and also have allies on the outside to put pressure on the negative forces against the Congolese people. Absolutely, right. Kamali, in this context, uh, you mentioned uh, coltan, which is uh, of ex extreme, extraordinary importance today because of its use in the entire tech industry in our day-to-day -day lives so much. So especially in the past 20 to 25 years, could we talk about, for instance, how uh, especially Western countries, Western corporations have been sort of, uh, say, conducting their activities in the country? I mean, from 1996 to present, the struggle of the Congo has been who's going to control its resources and for whose benefit. In 1996, Colton was discovered in DRC. In 1996, the war started. And there is a media nar narrative of what happened in the Congo. Tapping of a dictator, uh, displacement of population, and sometimes they may snuck in the centers of ethnic conflict. Right. Uh, that this is the reason why this conflict uh, has started. Uh, but on a very serious note, over 6 million Congolese people have died due to this conflict. And we can even argue that we will never know how many Congolese people have died. We know millions have died. Um, the number I'm quoting is a study of the mortality, a mortality study of, from the International Rescue Committee Right. That states right. that from 1998 to 2007, 5.4 million Congolese have died at the rate of 45,000 people uh, dying every month. 2007 is way far from today. Right. So we know millions have died in this conflict uh, due to this uh, greed of uh, control of resources that's needed for modern day technology. And for as we understand what capitalism does, and you look at Congo in the uh, chain, it's clear. Get the resources at a cheap price, and even if it means human cost, it won't matter. And that brings me to uh, Bolivia. You know, I'm thinking about uh, the Tesla CEO, Elon Musk, who says we will cool whoever we want to cool. Uh, when he was uh, speaking around uh, lithium in uh, Bolivia. Mm -hmm. They have been doing coups in the Congo to take control of Congo's cobalt, Congo's coltan, Congo's gold, Congo's tin, uh, and all the different resources that we have, copper and so on, right? right? And uh, 
what the Congolese people have been fighting to stop, it is killing beyond what the media narrative will, will share. Because in these past two decades, Congolese have been resolute in uh, fighting the oppression that they face. Right. They face a brutal regime of their local elite who control the state. They, they're facing Congo's neighbors, you know, their neighbors, Rwanda and Uganda, who are US allies on the so-called war on terror. These two countries have invaded the Congo twice in 96 and 98 and unleashed the death of uh, the millions of Congolese today. They're facing multinational corporation, the Glencore, the Bonero. I mean, the United Nations have published numerous reports citing names of corporations that are illegally pilfering Congo's resources. You have the World Bank and IMF, especially in the period of COVID, have given Congo over a billion dollars. Um, how are we going to pay uh, for that? And they're putting to, uh, policies that's literally affecting the Congo. Things such as they are responsible for writing the mining laws of the DRC. They are responsible for writing the forestry laws of the DRC. These have been, uh, are being reviewed, have right. been reviewed, but initially they're the one who set up policies that allow for mining corporations to come and get access to Congo's lands at wholesale. And then you have the unilater another unilateral institution that I always mentioned, is the United Nations, which is very complex, where you look at a Security Council, where two members of the Security Council, the United States and the United Kingdom, are supporting nations destabilizing the Congo, and they do not do anything to stop it. So when you look at that, and you, you know, as a young African, and look at US policy toward Latin American countries, particularly Venezuela, you wonder, where is the more right to even say anything about democracy anywhere when they have supported invasions of the DRC causing deaths of millions? They have backed and installed dictators such as uh, Mobutu, who stayed in power for 32 decades. They have assassinated democratically elected leaders such as Patrice Lumumba, who came from the aspiration of the Congolese. And not only that, in 1884 and 85, they even participated in the carving up of the African continent, the so-called Berlin Conference. And in 85, they signed the Act of Berlin on stating that they will support King Leopold. They were the backers of King Leopold II to get access to the land. So their record on the African continent, particularly the Congo, is something that anyone will say that they have no moral rights to talk about democracy in the world because of the destabilization they have caused in the Congo. Absolutely. And Kambale, in recent time, I mean, you talked about also the long tradition of resistance and especially again over the past 20 years, especially during the term of Joseph Kabila, despite the heavy repression, there has been wave after wave of resistance, especially by the youth, as you pointed out. So could you also talk a bit about the kind of resistance that continued applying pressure on Kabila even when internationally he was uh, celebrated or he was say, accepted by the international community. Indeed, and even during the, the war, we shall be very clear. The reason why the death toll is so high is because they cannot destroy the spirits of the Congolese people who are right. continuing to fight for change in the country. Right. Some have created in some of the regions local resistance against rebel militias. Most of the time, they actually have number of guns, but this is also happening. And then you also have a very vibrant youth who, in 2011, 2015, 2018, they stood in front of the instrument of violence of the Cong of Congolese government. It's, it's military and it's police. Young Congolese know how many bullets are in the AK-47. Why? Whenever they're in the protest and the police start shooting, they don't shoot with rubber, they shoot live bullets. So they hide and count how many bullets left in the gun and then come out again protesting. Many young Congolese have died protesting uh, the brutal regime of Kabila who took power in 2001 after the death of Laurent Kabila and he did not want to leave power after two terms. Right. of his presidency 
And that precipitated many protests. And the one that I want uh, people to remember is the Telema uprising. The Telema uprising started in January of 2015, when on January 19th, 2015, a major protest was called by opposition leaders. The population went out. When they got to the point of protest, there was no politicians around. Some people stopped going home, but it took the student of the University of Kinshasa to start rallying the population. And the numbers grew, and the numbers grew. The numbers were so big that the state got scared and they did what they always do. They shut off the internet, they shut off text messaging, and they even shut off phone calls, direct calls to people. But the city was shut down by the youth of Kinshasa for two weeks, demanding that the Congolese government does not pass a law in the Senate calling uh, for a census before presidential election, which they saw was an attempt to delay the presidential election. Right. That resistance of two weeks saw many young Congolese people die. And we may not know the numbers, yet in March of that year, a mass grave was found in the capital city of Kinshasa with the bodies of 400 young Congolese. I argue these bodies are the bodies of young Congolese and the Congolese government has refused to investigate uh, the death, uh, the, the bodies that, that were found during that time. And our resistance continued even in 2018. Um, many, uh, unfortunately, were killed. Luke Kulula was killed in Goma. You have Rossi Chimanga, uh, who was a professor and a father who was actually shot in front of a church while he was protecting protesters um, within a church enclosure. He was shot and killed. Therese Kapangala, she was also shot inside of a church. And the reason I'm mentioning churches is during the protest, churches became the safe heaven of many protesters. They were using it as a, um, a space for mobilizing or organizing, and most protests usually started from the space. So the military and the police did not care where you were organizing. They came in with guns, shot at protesters and many died. But they, the energy of the youth, uh, the spirit that they had, that's why I said, you know, as we speak today, we say that Kabila is no longer president, but he still control many uh, right. state institutions. Um, people may see it as uh, the Congolese people did not succeed. I would say, no, there are things that we succeeded on. Mm -hmm. There was a man who refused to leave power Right. And it took blood, sweats, and feet of the Congolese in the streets to stop a brutal regime from, uh, from staying in power longer than they're supposed to. Absolutely. But the struggle is not over. As now we are looking into what's happening in Nigeria, seeing also the same protest happening there. This morning I was looking at the news. I'm seeing it's also happening in Guinea. Uh, there are protests also happening there. Cote d'Ivoire is happening that in this pandemic from the United States all the way to India, going into even the Congo, the people are saying that we have two pandemic. One, COVID-19, and two, a people's revolution where people want to determine their own affairs, when people want to have a say in the decision-making process. So these protests happening from George Floyd to now Ansars in Nigeria and the Telema uprising in the Congo is a clear determination to me, a clear indication to me that the people of the world are slowly but surely uniting for change so that we can all control our own affairs in our countries. Thank you so much, Kambale, for speaking to us. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching People's Dispatch. Viene cantar que vamos a triunfar